Welcome to the Producers Chair, where Nashville's top record producers give you their stories on how they got started in the music business. Join us at Soundstage Studios in Nashville as they share defining moments in their careers to their historic relationships with the biggest artists, musicians, and songwriters in the industry today. And now, the host of the Producers Chair, James Ray. On this episode of the Producers Chair, I welcome Mark Bright. Mark's meteoric rise from the tape room to the vice presidency of Scream Gems EMI Music and his two-year stint as president and CEO of Word Entertainment definitely provided Mark with a world of knowledge that only a handful of producers have been privy to. We're here tonight, Mark, to celebrate your career. Awesome. Your body of work and your contributions to the music industry in Nashville because they are significant. And um, I'm so pleased that you could do this tonight. Thank you for being here. And my, my honor and pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, tell me something. When, you know, you, you moved here in like 1981. Mm -hmm. You were about 22 years old at the time, yeah. right? When you moved here, did you have a sense that you and Nashville were gonna have such a love affair? No, honestly. Um, you know, I've, I talked my folks into uh, uh, moving to Nashville or allowing me to move to Nashville as a, as a uh, young, sort of sheltered person uh, uh, because I was going to go to Belmont mm -hmm. uh, and take, uh, you know, music business courses. Right. Um, and, and although I really enjoyed uh, my three magnificent years as a as a junior at Belmont. <laughs> I, I can't say that I was academically inclined uh -huh. um, uh, because I was too distracted by all the shows and the songwriters and the studios. And so I, uh, I, I always wanted to be a record producer. I always wanted to. You had a sense of that early? I, as a young, I, I, I used to, uh, my sister would buy Beatles records, uh -huh. uh, but she wouldn't let me hear them. Uh, oh. But when she would leave the house to sneak out, I mean, to, to go hang out with her friends, I'd sneak into her room oh, and, and, play, her and records. play those Beatles records. And I would note, I noticed early on, and I was just, I was really young, that um, there was this guy on there uh, named George Martin. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, you know, honestly, I don't want to be the Beatles. I want to be the guy that tells the Beatles what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, just as an early at an early age, yeah. it, it occurred to me that that might be a good thing. Yeah, and I understand that um, when you were at Belmont, um, you met John Briggs. I did. And didn't he? He wound up actually uh, moving um, out of a job at at um, Screen Gems EMI. Yes. And you. He arranged for you to get that job. He did. Is he was right? in the tell tape us, room. Tell us that story. Um, well, uh, I met John. Um, I was uh, I was walking back to my apartment on 16th Avenue, um, uh, and I I had my my bicycle with me, and and I was coming down the hill on 16th, and it started raining. Uh, I hadn't met John. Uh, in, in the class, it was a big class, music theory or some kind of class, and he pulls over and says, hey, I'm in your class, you want me to g give you a ride the rest of the way home? And and that's really how I met John, uh -huh. and the reason why he pulled over is because I'd moved here from Texas with this really pretty girl that we were just friends, but he he wanted to to get her Did you number say that from for me. Jennifer? We were just friends. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and uh, there were about four of us that, that moved here all from the, the same school and everything. Yeah. And uh, and that started a, a, a relationship all those years ago between John and I. And John had a room. I mean, had a uh, um, a job in the tape room at Screen Gems, Cold Gems Music, mm -hmm. uh, which was right, literally across the street from where I lived. And uh, and uh, Charlie Feldman ran that office. A lot of us here know Charlie's a, uh, a executive in, uh, at BMI in New York City now, has been for years. Uh, but he ran the publishing office and, and John uh, put in a good word for me. And sure enough, when John moved over to ASCAP all those years ago, mm -hmm. I got the job. Wow, wow. And um, you started in the tape room. I did. And 12 years later, Mark's vice president of the place. 
I mean, well, that's, and, and, and that's, that's that's cool, but it just did I not say that no, right? No, and that's that's really that's the truth. It's, yeah. It, but the the to my credit, I always happened to be in the bathroom when they came down from New York to fire people. So I just never got <laughs> fired. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's like a meteoric rise, you know, from the tape room to the vice presidency. How did you do that? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know. You, I mean, I mean looking, like looking back on it, there must have, you must have had some sort of insight into that whole world that, that was um, pretty acute. I think my, my perspective uh, in this business is always, always to 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 be a good student of the business. Mm -hmm. So I always had a real passion to uh, learn as much as I could. And, you know, even when I wasn't working, I was, um, you know, going to shows, meeting agents, meeting managers, and people that were out of my immediate field of vision, but just trying to get to know all these people. And also, you know, being an engineer, one of the things I got to do in the t as, as a tape room operator is work for free for, for screen gyms at night doing publishing demos. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, the, the upside was I got to meet a lot of people and I developed a reputation for, man, you ought to let this kid, you know, engineer your, your, your publishing demo because he mm -hmm. knows what he's doing and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. you know, uh, as, so as I was learning the, my, the skill set in, uh, for songs and in publishing, uh, I was also um, uh, working on these, developing my skills, working uh, at engineering and sort of trying to figure out the finer points of how to make a record and yeah. how to w work with artists yeah. and musicians. Mm -hmm. And then in 1992, you signed Henry Paul. I did. I met right? Henry Paul, who was at that point had just come come out of a band called the Outlaws, which you know had some some pop. Mm -hmm. They were a southern rock band, and they'd had some hits at radio. Uh, but I met Henry through another artist named Henry Gross. Henry was one of the original members of the band Sha Na Na right. that played at Woodstock. Right. Um, and he also had a hit um, that he wrote and sang in 1979 called Shannon, and the song was about a dog. Yep. And, I remember uh, the song. And I I would hang out with Henry. Um, uh, and we just sort of met um, through, I believe it was Ralph Murphy, uh, all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got to be good friends, and he loved guitars, I loved guitars, he had studio equipment, and I loved operating that studio equipment, so we were big pals. So it was Henry Gross who knew, who knew Henry Paul, right. and he made the introduction, got to know Henry, and, and, uh, and he was really my first signing as a publisher to, yeah. at that point, it, the, the publishing company had um, matri matriculated into EMI Music Publishing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and Henry, um, now, um, he was, al was he already working with, um, with Dave Robbins and Van Stevenson? Uh, they uh, were already working together, but just um, um, Tim Dubois, um, Didn't he was, sign them to a production deal? He signed, had signed them to a production deal. Yeah, and this they, is Blackhawk, by the way. Yes. Okay. And, um, yeah. Um, so, of course, Henry was on Arista Records, uh, New York, all those years in, as a member of the Outlaws. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Tim Dubois was running Arista, running Arista, Arista Records here. Right. Uh, and had written with um, Van Stevenson and uh, Dave Robbins. Mm -hmm. They wrote... Um, the three of them wrote um, The Bluest Eyes in Texas, which, you know, still a song that a lot of people know, and, and several other hits. So he was pals with them, but he kind of put that, those three guys together, Henry, Van, and Dave, right. and assigned them to a production deal. They had gone in with another producer, and it just was apparently terrible. Pretty bad, yeah. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so I began working with them casually at night, in a studio called the Rat Hole, which was the, the downstairs uh, publishing studio at EMI. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, uh, we were located in the old Combine Publishing Building, which is no right. longer exists yeah. now, unfortunately. But that's where we started hanging out and working on demos and figuring out a sound. Right. And we got a sound, um, and um, their manager, Rick Alter, took the demo we did to to Tim Dubois 
uh, and he called me, and uh, he he said, Mister, I want you to come sit down with me. Let's talk about this tape you made. And uh, he was from Oklahoma and had that <laughs> sort of thick Western accent. And he says, you know, I don't know what you did, but this thing sounds amazing, so you're going to get to produce the record. How about that? Wow. And I just couldn't believe it. And that, you know? was, that was the beginning yeah, right there. That was the beginning of my production Isn't that career. wonderful? Tim Dubois. Yeah. Yeah, I owe and, Tim and my cool, career. And the coolest thing was that um, Tim... You, I, I remember you told me when, when we were talking about this, you know, a few days back, um, that Tim was very aware of the fact that you were the new kid on the block, mm -hmm. you were the new producer, nobody knew you, you had no credentials. Right. And as a gift, literally, Tim said, I'm going to put my name as co-producer on the album to lend it credibility. He said, I'm not going to produce anything, you're going to produce the whole record yourself. But he said, I'm going to put my name on there as a co-producer, right? And, and I he did. And then he, he left me with the one caveat, don't mess this up. <laughs> that you that's got not it. quite how you put it when you told me uh, well, the first time. Yes. It was like, I have a 10-year-old daughter here, so <laughs> that's, that's, we're going to go with that for now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and I mean, what an incredible thing for him to do. And, you know, um, when we did um, our interview for the Rofax column, um, you know, you were telling me that um, Tim, you know, as far as production and producing goes, was really your number one mentor here, in, here in town. Tell us a little bit about um, that relationship. Well, you know, back in those days, Tim um, was very involved in records and from the standpoint of listening to the songs with artists, with producers, and, you know, and whenever... Tim was involved uh, doing that from that aspect, he had hit, uh, hit act after hit act after hit act. Alan Jackson, yeah. Brooks oh, and Dunn, um, Diamond Rio, mm -hmm. uh, just on and on and on. Yeah. And, and I believe, I truly believe that it's because he was very hands-on as a creative person, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, listening to songs for the artists, with the artist and and not demanding that they record anything, just just being one of the people, one of the guys, you know, yeah. in the band sort of, and yeah. saying, you know what, I think that's a killer song, and everybody go, yeah, I do too, or I hate that one. He was just right there, and that's how he was with with Blackhawk, and and he sort of had that that sort of friend you'd want to have kind of attitude, mm -hmm. and um, I just thank God for him truly because you know that that's the kind of the person that w that's willing to take on that role and 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 really be helpful and yeah. uh, be a teacher and he he was that guy. I don't think there's um, too many people um, who have listened to country music who weren't fans of Blackhawk. <laughs> quite frankly, I mean they were such a huge act. Um, they sold well over four million mm -hmm. records, and um, they did. I think you produced six studio albums, is that correct? Uh, four and a greatest hit. Four and a greatest hit. And, and listen, hit. I was as stunned as anybody that they actually had their first hit. I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, I, these guys were 40 years old. And if you I, know, <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> I know. And if I'm not mistaken, um, the song Goodbye Says It All, I believe, was their first. Yep. Yeah, isn't that a yep. great song? Great song. Why are you pointing over there? Huh? I can't hear you. Bobby Fisher. Bobby Fisher. Oh, oh my God. hi, Bobby. Bobby Fisher. I love Bobby, Bobby Fisher. Stand up, stand up, Bobby. And, I, and that's how I got to know oh, Bobby was through wonderful. that song. And you know he's still writing his tail end off even to this day. My I still get songs goodness. from Bobby. I gotta say, I co-wrote with Charlie. Charlie Black. Charlie Black. Cray, yeah, yeah, and Johnny and Johnny McRae. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you so much for being here. That's oh, that's wonderful. awesome. So, um, and then in 1995, that was in '94, right? In yes. 95, you produced their, uh, their second album, Strong Enough. Mm -hmm. In 97, you produced Peter Satira. And then in 1998, you left EMI and co-founded your first co-venture with Donna Hilly and Sony Tree. Tell us about that co-venture. 
Uh, well, uh, EMI and Sony ATV had been great competitors. You know, mm -hmm. it, they, they they fought year in year out to, to to see who would be publisher of the year at the BMI and ASCAP awards. So. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knew everybody else at the companies there. No, they were sort of, along with, with Warren Chapel Music at the time, they were sort of the big three. And, um, uh, and even though, you know, I knew Donna peripherally, I, I really didn't have much of a relationship with her. So when I was invited to leave EMI, <laughs> um, but um, bum. Yeah. <laughs> um, she called. She called me out of the blue, and said, "Mark, it's Donna Hilly," and uh, she didn't sound like that. She sounded like her, um, <laughs> and she said, "So, what are you up to these days?" I said, "Well, I, other than being fired, I'm not doing a whole lot." And she said, you know, I've, I've always um, um, liked what you've done, like, like what you were doing in the business. And are you interested in starting a joint venture publishing company with my company? And I said, I mean, before she even finished saying it, I said, yes, yes. I literally couldn't believe it. Um, Woody Bomar was her second in command at that point, And mm -hmm. he was, uh, had reached out to me also. And um, uh I remember we we made a publishing production management deal with them, uh, and the deal was done start to finish in nine days. Sounds complicated. And in fact, uh, <laughs> Malcolm Mims was my attorney at that point. Uh, we'd gone into our office to sign the contract, um, and we had pictures and all that stuff, and. After, um, after the pictures and after the signing of the contract, she asked Malcolm if he would stay behind for a minute. Mm -hmm. And every, all, all the rest of us left. Yeah. Um, and so I was very curious what that was about. And so I called Malcolm and I said, so are you able to tell me what she wanted to talk to you about? He says, yeah. Okay, I said, well, <laughs> what? <laughs> he says, well, she just asked me one question. And I said, which was? She said, Malcolm, what in the hell did I just sign? <laughs> because the deal was so complicated and had all these different That's areas. I just said it. It, sounded, uh, it sounds complicated. And yeah, and uh, but you know, we just had incredible. Incredible success together, and I just, you know, I, I know, I just I know, always loved her. I know, you know, it, it's funny because um, I don't, and I don't know why, but the terminology co-venture, okay, this comes up periodically, and every once in a while, you know, I'll I'll turn to who a friend of mine, a songwriter, or whoever here in town, right, and I, and I'll say, do you know what a co-venture is actually, and and why co-ventures happen? And just about every person I've ever asked that question of doesn't really know the answer, okay? Mm -hmm. So could you explain to us a little bit about why would, why would there be a co-venture? Well, I could, I, could get, I could get you know? drilled down very deep on that, but I won't. Okay. I'll, I'll say this. Yeah. Co-ventures exist because of an opportunity that the funding publishing company thinks might exist. Ah. In other words, they're going to say, "Okay, Joe Schmo, Mark Bright, we want to make it. We want to do a joint venture with you because of your relationships and right. your your area of influence. Right. We want to be in business with that, and, and we that's will, and why we will fund that, and we will fund it. Ah, uh, okay. and if um, but you know the caveat is, you have to." Absolutely, almost in every one of these I've ever seen, you, you have to be well in the black in year five. Yeah, yeah. And um, and in order to do that, you pretty much need to start having success with that thing in that first year. Right. Somehow, some way. And boy, you did. Dang. Um, Mark signed Brett James. <laughs> yeah, who a lot of who a lot of you know, of course, and. Um, Brett had how many cuts in the first year? Like forty-four cuts. He did. I mean, it was it was really crazy. I had worked with Brett 
back in our EMI days together. He was a, um, a songwriter artist signed to Arista Careers record. Yeah. Um, that, that record went nowhere fast. Uh, but EMI had signed into a six-figure publishing deal. Mm -hmm. Well, when when the, the 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 record didn't pan out, didn't sell anything, they they dropped him. They had so to. he lost his record deal. He lost and his, his publishing and his deal. publishing deal. So I went to him. Um, now, at uh, that point in time, when you approached him, had he had any cuts as a writer? Had never had a cut outside of the songs he recorded for his so own album. So why did you approach him? There was there just some. What was um, it about Brett well, that you I, saw? Well, uh, I there was. My own thought about it, but there was also an independent thought. My friend Michael Martin, mm -hmm. uh, who now runs ASCAP, mm -hmm. uh, said, "You know, you you know that they just dropped Brett," <laughs> and I said, "Oh, they sure did." And it really got me thinking. Um, I should call him because I I had a good relationship with him, and I thought he was brilliant. I thought he was passionate, and uh, I thought, you know what, I could probably sign him f for very little. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I did, and I, I don't know how much you want me to go into that, but you know, the, the moment that I signed him about, I don't know, a month after the, signing I'd him for, for, I'd love to I know. Him <laughs> for $25,000. Okay. And, um, and about a month and a half after that, he says, he called me and said, I need to have breakfast with you. Okay. We go to Pancake Pantry, have breakfast. And he says, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. It's like, bad news first, dude. He said, well, my, my daddy pulled some strings and got me back into med school, into which he'd already school. quit before. Back in Oklahoma. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I can't live on $25,000. I've got a family. I said, I understand, but yeah. that's what I had to offer. And, and of course, you accepted. Uh, he said, I can't. It's, I, I need to get back into med school but mm -hmm. you know what I've met this this guy named Troy Virgis and we've been writing some great songs together and I make you a promise that we will literally he'll drive down to Oklahoma every weekend and we'll write songs mm -hmm. and I said okay yeah. I'm in yeah so I've you know we we continue with the deal and then um, 11 10, 10, 11 months later, we had gotten over 40 songs recorded on, with those two guys and, and Hillary Lindsay yeah. in, in that, that, that trio. And uh, it was just, it was crazy how um, and that worked. And of course, a lot of it had to do with, I, I hired this song plugger named Kelly King, uh -huh. uh, and she really developed a great relation, working relationship with Brett and those other writers. And she fostered those relationships and uh, it was just unbelievable. And one of the uh, one of the first cuts we got. In fact, his first cut was not a single, but it was on that Faith Hill Breathe album that sold. Love is 10, a sweet. Love is a sweet thing. Love is a sweet thing. Sold ten million records. I know. <laughs> I know. Unbelievable. And and you um, you also had. Um, Martina McBride's Blessed. Yes. And, and Jessica Andrews, Who I Am. Who I Am was I uh, mean, the first geez. single. Uh, that was our first number one yeah. together as, a, as yeah. a, a Brett and I as a publisher. Yeah. Unbelievable. And then um, in 205, you sold Terracell. Yeah. Right? Yep. And um, we did you get a load of this. Mark sold Terracell for the largest multiple ever paid for a co-venture at that point in time. At the time, yeah. And at it the just, time. you know, and, and, right? and it was because um, we just, it was a young catalog, but we had so many hits in I it know. that it made it just very attractive, attractive yep. and we had a lot of companies after it. And of I course, uh, joint ventures have been sold for many times that now, mm -hmm. but at the time it yeah, was. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah. Yeah, um, some of the, some of the uh, songs, of course, in the catalog included Kenny Chesney's "When the Sun Goes um, When the Sun Goes Down," Rascal Flatts' "Bless the Broken Road," God, um, uh, Carrie Underwood's "Jesus Take the Wheel," um, and and um, and then you started 
my um, my good girl music. Right. From that point on. Right. Right. Which um, eventually turned into Chatterbox Music, right. which is now your artist development company. Exactly right. Okay, I got it right. So you did good, James. How about that? <laughs> it's kind of hard to <laughs> keep up with all these company yeah, names and everything. But, but, but really, you know, these. And we're going to talk about all yeah, the artists great. development that you're, that you're doing a little later. Okay. Great. Um, right. But yeah. you know, all these companies exist because of. Um, my passion for artist development. So, mm -hmm. and, and they've, you know, we've bought and sold those catalogs along the way, yep. and, uh, and it's allowed me um, to work with new artists that, mm -hmm. um, that maybe nobody else will take a chance on or, do, or that I get to hear before everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Well, you are an incredible talent picker, a yeah, talent scout, I guess, you know, I should probably use the right terminology. And, um, you know, I forgot to mention when we were talking about, you know, that period of time that Mark was going through um, all of that. I just forgot to mention that along the way, he just happened to discover an act called Rascal Flats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was just, great. Just by chance. And, um, and I understand that it was um, Mila Mason it that was. actually called you up yep. and got you down to Printer's Alley. Or were they playing? They were playing Tell at the, the fiddle story. and steel guitar bar yeah. and down in Printer's Alley. And uh, um, Milo was a friend of my, my, mine and my partners at the time. And, and uh, she would just drop by on occasion and hang out and mm -hmm. uh, maybe listen to songs or play us songs. But she came by one afternoon in the, in the summer. Of, I, I believe it was maybe 1999 or 2000 somewhere in there and uh said you know there's a, these guys playing down on printer's alley you you, you, need, you need to go see them you need to go check them out yeah. like yeah yeah my love that's great you know and, but she kept coming back about the third time we thought we okay. should go down there and check it out yeah and uh, we went down there and and heard these blokes playing and a bunch of young dudes and um thought good grief they're yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, when you, when you um, sat in the audience and you heard them for the first time, I mean, what was going on in your I, mind? Uh, well, the, the, the thing that was going on was that in my mind was that lead singer can sing his tail off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's country, but I do know he can sing his tail off. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, just casually after, after that show invited him to the office, and a couple of days later they show up, and there's like six of them. Um, and <laughs> we're thinking, wow, I, there's three of these guys we don't even know. We yeah. didn't even meet. And yeah. they were kind of like part of the posse, I think. Yeah. And uh, um, they sang for us, and um, we said, you know, we pulled Gary aside and said, listen, man, if, if, the, if the three of you will show up maybe tomorrow or the next day after, we, we can talk some business. And mm -hmm. so... Um, Gary and Joe Don and Jay came back and um, um, we struck up a deal and um, and made a contract and what was it like a production deal? It was a publishing production deal because I had the deal with Donna Hilly, which allowed me right. to have funds, yeah, but not quite enough. I mean, so all I, of a sudden I that complicated contract started to make sense. Yes, um, <laughs> that. Uh, but the problem was I I didn't have enough money inside the joint venture budget to get them off the road. Right. Uh, because two of them were playing in Shelley Wright's road band. Okay. And uh, Joe Don and Jay. Mm -hmm. And Gary was digging, um, digging up ground to where the company he worked for could put above ground swimming pools in. He would flatten out the ground with a shovel. And so every afternoon they'd come in, he would just come in smelling like a pig. I mean, it's just horrible, you know, because he, he came right from work and he was drenched in sweat. The other two guys, you know, um, were kind of young little 90-pound uh, weakling looking dudes. And, yeah. and um, <laughs> but, you know, we started working with it vocally and, and, and it was – it was sort of life changing in the sense that, boy, you know, and this I, could be, this could really be something. Yeah. And. Um, and how much development did you? How long a period of time before you actually? It was not long. Did a it was a, It was about. We developed probably. Um, we had them in development for approximately eight months. Okay. 
Um, and it, and that, that time, the whole idea was to try to, you know, get a blend and, and get um, Jodon working out some upper body weights and, you know, and, and getting us, uh, some yeah. haircuts and some showers and, sure. Sure. <laughs> you know, those kind of things. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> it was so funny to, to think about it because they were, you know, they had no money. And, yeah. uh, and in fact, um, I had to, um, uh, I had, had gotten my house paid off at the time. I had to go get another mortgage on it just to, to have enough money to get them to, to be off the road mm -hmm. and uh, to pay for um, the production costs and uh, instruments and so forth and so on. So right. uh, it was sort of one of those deals that had it not worked, I would have been in deep, deep financial Doo -doo. trouble yeah. yes <laughs> it would have not been pretty well you got a call from joe galanti about um a new artist mm -hmm. right yep and um that artist of course was carrie underwood and that began a relationship that has become historical here in nashville and hysterical <laughs> and hysteric historical and hysterical and um i want you to just tell us that story about how that unfolded and how you met Carrie and went out to Kansas City with you know Joe and Renee to meet her and so um, I'll try to make it reasonably quick but yeah I'd made a lot of records for Joe some good some not so good and when they were not so good he would be sure to let me know <laughs> uh, but I, I love Joe I uh, he was another mentor for me he taught me a whole lot about the, the business mm -hmm. of making music in the business of selling music. Um, and uh, a lot of people don't know that, that Joe always had, a, had, had developed a good ear for songs. He never called himself a song guy, but he, he had, he had yeah. it, yeah. Um, um, and he expressed it in a different way than Tim Dubois did, but, but he had a very good sense of it. Uh, I remember I'd, I'd made, I don't know, four or five records in the past for him. I was, uh, at this point, I was making a, um, the first album on uh, Sarah Evans, the first one that we did together. Mm -hmm. It's in the studio at Sound Kitchen out in um, Franklin, Brentwood area. And uh, he calls me and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, Joe, I'm making the Sarah Evans record right now. I want to say, what, you don't remember that you... <laughs> you know. He says, no, no, I mean, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I'm literally in the control room. He goes, Go, leave the, con the control room, get someplace where you can talk. Said, okay. And so I find a closet in the studio facility, and he says, okay, so um, you know who Clive Davis is? I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not yeah. stupid. <laughs> And he said, listen, um, okay, so um, Clive is listening to our conversation right now. I'm in New York. Um, do you know who Carrie Underwood is? And I said, shoot, yeah. Well, I said, shoot, yeah, like, of course, but I'd only, I saw the finale and the, the, the show before the right finale, right, yeah. the last two episodes, yeah. and I happened to, to watch her mm -hmm. and, and I remember specifically watching the finale. They had that show. They had all these legendary record producers sitting in the audience, like David Foster and all these guys. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, she's such an incredible singer. And they got all these legendary yeah. artists. I mean, I might as well. I mean, I'd love to work on that. But, you know, so would everybody else in this town yeah. and every other music town. Um, he said, okay, look. Um, I want you to produce the country slides for us. And, and, and I just worked this out with Clive. And so here's the deal. Uh, next week, you and I and Renee Bell are going to get on a private jet. We're going to fly to St. Louis. And if you're going to meet her. And if she likes you, you're in. If she doesn't, it's off. That's and it. I said, just on a meeting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, you know, so I remember flying to St. Louis with them. And um, uh, the moment I get there, they whisk me off to the hotel. And Joe and Renee, Joe and Renee go to a label meeting talking about high-end label stuff. And, and I'm stuck with this, this um, L.A. agent that just scared the 
bejesus out of me. The guy was <laughs> so intimidating. He was sitting there like across the table like this and sort of like, you know, have you done anything I, I would have known or, you know, oh, really God, trying yeah. to intimidate me. And, I, and, yeah. I, and um, uh, uh, he, he's still one of her agents to this day. And he really but it did a great job. He turned out to be all bark and no bike, bite. He's a lovely guy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, man, it, how, I mean, how many of these people am I going to have to talk to before I actually had this meeting where, yeah. you know, I get my teeth kicked in with Carrie. <laughs> um, so for an hour I waited, and then finally they call us up to her hotel room there at uh, W in St. Louis. And, uh, and I walk in, and and there's like 20 people in this hotel room suite. And I'm thinking, wow, what, this is weird, yeah. you know? And, um, and so they make an introduction and so they, they introduced me to Carrie and she kind of just looks at me and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Mark, you know? <laughs> she said, nice to meet you. Um, so you're from Texas. And I said, yeah, she goes, I'm from Oklahoma. Um, and we sat in a circle and just talked about, you know, what was happening with the career. Mm -hmm. And that was, and then we left. I get on the flame, plane, fly back to. And that was it. And, and Joe set, calls me the first thing the next day and says, okay, you're in. You got a month to do this album, one month. And he says, I tell you what, at this point, I don't really care what you record. Just don't be late. Turn it in on time. Wow. So I made it a point. So to within turn that, weeks, you were in the studio. Literally, um, and, we were and, in. And had Carrie already um, had, the, had Joe or Carrie or A and R people already found material for that? First well, album? one of the songs that they <laughs> liked, um, which they told me in the meeting that they they liked, was a song out of my catalog. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, it was the song "Jesus Take the Will." Ah. It's like, yeah, we should record that one. Yeah. And <laughs> that yeah. sounds great with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, really, I think I brought in one song, Renee brought in two or three or four, and Carrie and her manager had some other songs that they liked. And so we, um, you know, had enough to do it. But the, the thing that I think that was so great about that opportunity is we had to do it so quickly, so fast that, yeah. man, we didn't have time to think about it. We just knocked it out. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then after we recorded the tracks, uh, my engineer and I were flying all over the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, wherever the, the idol tour was. Sure. To, for, for them to pull her off the, the tour for a day. And we run into a recording stu studio and record vocals. And that's how we got the vocals done. Gosh. And, and had Carrie had a lot of experience in the studio? Um, at that moment? A little bit. Uh, she had worked, interestingly enough, with uh, anybody remember Doug Howard? Sure. Uh, still a, still around but Doug had um, when she was just a kid uh, she'd come to town mm -hmm. with her mom and they had made her a record she you know wasn't ready she was very again very very young and right. that was the extent of her recording I think they did three songs so right. she um, but you know Carrie was always one of those things with those people that she was so musical seriously that you know, you could have put her into any type of situation, any kind of pressure cooker, she and all shine. she's going to do is shine. Yeah. She's going to kill it yeah. every single time. Yeah. In 2008, um, shortly after that, you became uh, CEO of Word Entertainment. Mm -hmm. That must have been a... How, I mean, did you get a phone call out of the blue one day from somebody saying, hey... Well, I, I had developed... Um, uh, a friendship with a guy that was running Warner Brothers Records named Bill Bennett at the time. Mm -hmm. And we became f uh, really good friends. And they had reached um, a sort of a plateau at Word Entertainment, which was owned by Warner Brothers. It was a part of the Warner Brothers right. system. Bill had been talking to his boss, Tom Wally, out in L.A. Uh, about, you know, we need to we need to get somebody out there that you know, that's, that's a believer, but has worked in the secular music entertainment and ha has in the music area and mm -hmm. has relationships there and maybe could find artistry that was not just in that little bubble of the Christian music world. Right. And so Bill just brought it up at lunch one day. He goes, have you ever thought about running a label? And I said, 
nope, <laughs> I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> I've, no, I've never. He goes, well, what do you think about that? I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're, you know, word entertainment. I said, well, of course, you know, I, I've, being a Texan, I was very, you know, word got its start in Waco, Texas. Mm, I, and, I didn't uh, even know that. Yeah. yeah. And um, Chet McCracken was the guy that started it mm -hmm. and uh, down in Waco. Uh, and so I had been aware of, of, of the, the label and, of course, Christian music because I'd, I originally thought I would be a Christian music producer. Um, mm -hmm. That didn't work out. Um, anyway, um, so the, the, that opportunity was amazing because Word was a completely sort of all-in label. It had its own distribution, it had its own merch, it had its agency business, music publishing company. Mm -hmm. It was, it encapsulated the entire music business from top to bottom. Right. Um, and so, you know, they, they talked me into it. And, uh, and they said, listen, you can still make your country records, you can produce Carrie and all these other people, all you want. We just, we want you to run it. And how many employees were there over there? 116. <laughs> <laughs> Which Are you was serious? Overwhelming. I'm so not good with names, and let you, me tell you, I had to get good with names very yeah, quickly. Yeah, really. So how did you balance your time? I mean, your your producing career has now like completely soaring. It's taking off, and now you've got this responsibility of 116 employees. Well, the the the, the, I mean, the other part of that was that when it, when Tom Wally, um, uh, I flew to to California to talk to him and and uh, that's where they offered me the deal he said look you know I don't want you to be the the big business executive what I want is your creative wisdom mm -hmm. I want you to to um, uh, use those relationships that you have and go find us some talent ah. uh, I don't need you to worry so much about you know, um, what the merch deal breakdowns are. I, yeah. I need you to learn that. But the whole idea is that you'll, you'll go run Word. And my friend Bill Bennett, who first talked to me about it, who was running Warner, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to move back to California. Mm -hmm. His wife really didn't love Nashville. And, and, he, and so the idea would be that I would run Word for two or three years right. and then go become the head of Warner Brothers Records. Oh. And I thought, you know, that's appealing. Sounds pretty good. Of course, about a year and a half into the deal, my boss, Tom Wally, gets fired. Um, and it sort of changes the it, whole way of land. And it made it sort it? of very unattractive yeah. for me to want to continue mm -hmm. there. Now, when that came about, when you actually left, um, I remember last time you were on the show, we talked just briefly about this. And uh, you were telling me that how you were, f I remember you were telling me how you were feeling at the time about the fact that whenever you were in the studio producing everybody, you felt as if you were neglecting Very, uh, everybody over yeah, word. Yeah, be because over we were in a position as a label, you know, the, the uh, record labels as a whole were finding themselves in this position of not making money because, yeah. um, you know, because of the Internet and, and uh, you know, file sharing and so forth and so sure. on. Um, we it just... It became a situation where, you know, about every um, six months, I had to fire people mm -hmm. just because we couldn't support the overhead of it. Yeah. And I recall very specifically the worst day of my career was when I had to personally fire 19 people in one day. Whoa. And it broke my heart. Hmm. Some of these people had worked at that company for 20 years or more. Really? And I remember thinking, you know, this isn't worth it. This is not worth it. I am, these Gosh. are lives. And these people, you know what, if I get fired, it ain't going to be that big of a deal because, you know, I can always, I know that if worst comes to worst, I can be a Walmart greeter. I yeah. can do that. <laughs> I, I, have, I have capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but these people, you know, had kids in college. They... Um, it was awful, and I, I really, you know, the whole entire time, I've, every time I was in the studio making a record, I felt guilty because I thought, if I'm in the studio making a record, I can't be running the company. Yeah. Um, and that made my employees vulnerable. Mm -hmm. 
And, and that's a terrible feeling. Yeah, I'll bet. And it got to me. Mm-hmm. It really got to me. Yeah. Um, so you left Word after about two years. Again, that was another situation where I was invited yeah. to, to leave the company because I, did, I quit showing up to the managing director's meeting in, in, in New York. I didn't li- like my boss. Lee or Cohen became my boss after that. And I just, he and I were like mud and water. Is that right? Yeah. He was the mud. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, um, so two years later, um, you left Word, and um, and you started your new publishing company. Yes. Right, my good girl music. And uh, you told me that Joe Galanti was probably, you know, Tim Dubois. When it came to being a mentor to you, was kind of the production mentor. Joe, on the other hand, was the business mentor. Yep. Right? Um, what was the best advice that Joe ever gave you? Um, about? Mark, it's not just about songs. It's not just about artists. Everybody in the music business is passionate about their own piece of the pie. And just because you make the record doesn't mean that the people that go promote it don't love it just as much as you do. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you put yourself in, in those shoes, it, it is an eye-opening, cathartic feeling. Yeah, yeah. Did, um, when you left Word, did you, in, did you call Joe? And tell him you were leaving. I first did call Joe and, and talk to him about I, listen, it before you actually. Oh yes, gave your I, I talked to he, even Joe had his own Christian label called Provident, yep. but we were friends, so I called him often, yeah. uh, and I called him to talk to him about, you know, um, like how to deal with Mike Curb because Mike Curb, even though um, I was uh, president and CEO, uh, in a deal that Mike had made with Warner Brothers years before that, he was the chairman. Mm. of word yeah uh, i wasn't told that when they hired me i didn't find that out until after the fact and i right. thought wow that's going to be interesting i'll never forget sitting in mike mike's parlor at, at his house being sort of um this is after i was hired and yeah. i thought well maybe i'm going to about to be unhired because of depending how this meeting goes and and it went well enough for mike to give his blessing on it and uh, uh but i really i found that I thought I knew a whole lot about business, but when it came to dealing with Mike Curb, I didn't know diddly squat. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and it's not that, that Joe specifically taught me how to deal with executives like Mike. It was just that he, um, he, he, he talked to me in, in these wonderful philosophical terms that really got me to, to understand that, you know, don't, don't, drill down on this one aspect of a person Mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a these people are complicated people they're big personalities and you need to learn how to deal with them yeah you know of all of the artists that you've produced um i think that i could safely say that the most iconic artist that you've ever produced i think is reba yeah (laughs) I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And, you know, I love Reba yeah. to this day. She is such a special, special person. And um, in 2009, the year before you left Word, um, you started producing Reba. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Well, I've worked in, uh, after we sold the studio mm-hmm. uh, upstairs here, um, I moved into the Starstruck building. I got a call from the studio manager at the time. There's this inner, you know, you can dial office to office in the Starstruck building. Oh, okay. So my phone rang one day. I pick it up. Mark, it's Reba. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, this, yeah. Mm-hmm. She goes, no, it really is. <laughs> I'm, I'm just upstairs. She goes, can you, go, can you come up and talk to me? I said, sure. Go upstairs, and she was, was uh, sitting there in her office in the one floor above me. And she says, I want to make a record with you. So she didn't have somebody do it for her. She just, I mean, literally called me on the phone, and, and, um, um, and that was that. Wow. Now, who was producing her up to that point? Tony Brown. Was had, it to- I was yeah. wondering if it was Tony. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, we did... Um, 
we kind of, as I recall, I think I did maybe seven of the songs on that album. He did three. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the reason why he did only did the three is because he was working on another artist and it was conflicting mm -hmm. at the same time. But, you know, and I'd known Tony, Tony for years. We were great friends, still are. So it, it was a wonderful, right. wonderful relationship. You know, a few months back about, I don't know, you know, four, five, six months ago, um, Jay DeMarcus um, was my guest on the show. And, um, and I know that Jay had had a, you know, a relationship with Reba. And so I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could get Reba on the telephone and just record the conversation and have her say something, you know, a little bit about Jay. And, and, and I know that many of you were at that show and, and, and you, you saw me do that. And um, I literally, I mean, I don't know Reba McIntyre, right? I picked up the phone, I called Starstruck, I told whoever answered the phone what I wanted to do. And do you know that, like, within two hours, I got a call from Reba. <laughs> who was That's my girl. Who was in Los Angeles. <laughs> I love it. Right? And said, hi, it's Reba. <laughs> Just like you said a minute ago, and I, I laughed. And it's I, unnerving, isn't it? It is unnerving. <laughs> And she literally called me, and we did a little telephone conversation, and I taped it oh, and played it on the show. That's and I fantastic. thought, boy, she really is special. Yes, lady. she is. You know, I mean, aside from the, you know, everything that she's recorded and, you know, being such an iconic artist and so on, there was just this genuine warmth there that I that I. She's a one of a kind, yeah. truly. Um, okay, let's talk about Derek Basin. <laughs> Okay, yep. you and Derek have been working together for years, that right? Frisky little sucker is, uh, <laughs> I can't seem to get him out of my life. You know, he's one of the most talented and brilliant people I've ever worked with. God, Derek is, is um, Mark's engineer, and uh, he's done all the Carrie Underwood albums with Mark and, and, and many, many other albums. Well, uh, what was the first work that you guys did together? Jody what? Messina, I'll never forget. It was Jody Messina? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know... Uh, I love Jody, but we we were like the, the, the proverbial oil and water. I mean, we just if if I said frick, she said frack, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and Derek um, had to be the person that sort of had to interpret what that meant. Are we going to record this song? Are we not? Or are they going to literally break out into a fight? Or are they going to hug like they were old friends? You know, yeah. and and I, and it was funny. But that was our first project together. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I called Derek up, um, you know, and informed him that you're going to be on the show tonight. I asked him if he could come down tonight. Unfortunately, he couldn't. So we did one of those phone calls, and <laughs> I, okay, and and he he has a wanted to send a little message out, wanted to tell you folks a little bit about um, Mark Bright in the studio and his relationship with Mark. So l can you play that clip for us? Hi, Mark. It's your old buddy, engineer colleague, Derek Basin. I'm so pleased to hear that the producer's chair is honoring you tonight. Certainly you have an extensive laundry list of successes in your career. And I hope that everybody attending the producer's chair tonight event is uh, able to learn a lot more about what makes up, you know, everything that you've given to this industry and all of the people that you've touched with all of the things that you've been able to accomplish. And uh, I certainly have been a big benefactor of that. I'd like to say a little something about all of you that are uh, able to attend tonight's producer's chair honoring Mark. Mark and I have known each other going up on 20 years. He and I first met when he was producing Blackhawk. He was in the midst of uh, making a uh, second Rascal Flatts record. And I had the uh, good fortunes of, uh, you know, really being in the right place at the right time when the uh, country music boom exploded in the 90s. So I ended up doing some overdub work. Uh, that. So I was able to help him out on that level um, probably in the years of 97, 98, 99. Mark reached out to me uh, again on a, uh, probably about 2003 and uh, wanted me to track an act for him in the studio, an artist named Jody Messina that he was producing at the time. That was the first opportunity I got to sit in the chair and track a record for him. He and I had a very good rapport. Right off the bat in the studio, several more acts came down the pike, and 
I kept getting calls from him. Once he and I kind of got the ball rolling in 03 and 04, I sit here in 2016 and have been doing projects over and over and over for him. Been blessed to work on such acts with him as Carrie Underwood, you know, acts like Sarah Evans, Reba McIntyre, and gosh, countless others. So it's, uh, it's really been a blessing for me to be able to work not just with such great awesome with him like him at the helm to really truly really make the project great from start to finish. It's been, a, uh, it's been a great run with him. I've been really, really, really fortunate. Let me describe to you how Mark is in the studio. One of the things that I learned uh, early on that Mark is very well respected in the publishing industry and is known for as much as his production quality is his song sense. At the end of the day, it's not how great your track is that you track. It's not how great your sounds are sometimes. It's really all about the song. And I think he always held that in the highest regard. He's always been extremely consistent with that over all the years that I've worked with him. So one thing I'd like to say to Mark is your ability to make everyone feel comfortable. There's a term I always like to use called boardside manner. Recording records is a very personal thing. He always made the room a great place to record in. I really appreciate his temperament in the studio, and he's been unbelievable at furthering my career on so many levels. And I just want to say thank you for all of the... Uh, Times and work over the years, my friend. Isn't that nice? That's yeah. so cool. Derek Basin. Yeah. It's a very talented man, very dear friend. Yeah. Tell you what. And you guys just did um, Kerry's um, latest album, Story Storyteller. Yes. Right? But the most recent thing we worked on was actually the, the Sunday Night Football. Oh, so. okay. Okay. Um, you know, you and I talked a little bit um, on the Storyteller album, on this album, right? This is the first album that Carrie has done where there are more than one producer on yeah. the album, right? And you and I talked about this, and I asked you about it because I'm starting to see more and more artists who have done many albums, you know, and, and they, seem to, they seem to do many albums with the same producer, and then at some point in time, and I'm just noticing this, you know, on the show myself, and then at some point, there's a point in time when, when it's time to explore a little bit, okay? And I think that's just about the way you, it, it, did I kind of interpret you right? That's, that's you right. I mean, I think um, y you need to, it's really, important to put yourself in an artist's shoes mm -hmm. um when a when an artist has had superstar success is exactly the right time that that artist needs to go man i i want to keep expanding i want to keep growing. Um, yeah. um growing my artistry how do i do that and how do I do that by still being loyal to the people that I um, have gone up the hill with? Yeah. Um, and and certainly in Carrie's case, um, you know, it. At some point, I'm thinking, you know, I've got to share this podium with with other people because, you know, we do what we do, but it is a thing. Yeah. It, it is a um, it's a specific uh, outcome mm -hmm. that you get when you put Carrie Underwood and Mark Bright in a recording studio together. Sure. Um, and so from her perspective, and, and again, I'm just giving you my perspective about her perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yep. um, um, you, you're, there has to be a point for which she goes, I wonder it, what it would be like because I've never done it, what it'd be like with another incredible producer. Mm -hmm. What I mean, what would that feeling be, be? Well, you know, I was fortunate in that she let me know that. Yeah, you she guys talked, talked to about me it. about it. Yeah. And, uh, now, and did, not, you, did you have any hand in suggesting no, that Jay Joyce or nope, Zach I did not. come in? I and, didn't. I, oh, um, okay. Um, uh, it was more about what is, what, what, you know, what my opinion was about certain producers out there, and of course, um, I've known Jay for all the way back to the MTM record days, mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he's literally made some of my favorite records. Yeah, um, the, the guy is brilliant, um, and the interesting thing is Jay does makes records completely opposite from the way I make records. Mm -hmm. So. I think 
Um, how, do you mean was, that? how do you mean that? Well, I mean, we just, you know, uh, you, you come to you, making you a record in your own you way. You talk about the process? The process, okay. yeah. Um, where, you know, he, he may uh, start with a cool, funky loop that he's uh, manufactured himself. Right. Um, with a, a guitar part. Um, uh, whereas I sort of, um, I've op always operated sort of strictly from a, um, be, um, from listening to a song and, and having an emotional um, feeling about the song, mm -hmm. and and sort of articulating that in my production style, big soaring choruses and um, right. a, a record sort of growing from verse to chorus where Jay is a groove dude. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the specific ways I could tell you that we're, we're coming from a little di bit different. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Uh, you listen to one of his, one of his great pieces of work like Springsteen, the song, yeah. you know, it's a, it's just this hardcore badass groove from start to finish. Yeah. Uh, and it just, and it gets inside of you from uh, about, a, you know, 30 seconds in. Oh, I hear you. Yeah. There's a lot of guys who think they collect guitars. You know, they got 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, maybe 50, maybe 50. I mean, I even know one guy here in town who's got, you know, 60 or 70 guitars, right? Mark has one of the most unbelievable guitar collections that I have ever come across in my life. There's, um, at one point in time, when you were last on the show, I know that your collection was over 150 guitars. Mm, it was a ridiculous. It was yeah. a ridiculous number of guitars. And um, I thought it would be really cool if you guys got a look at, at his <laughs> guitars. Yeah, so, so Mark and Jennifer gave us permission to come down to his home with a cameraman. And Mark and Jennifer started pulling some of Mark's most prized possessions out of his, out of the, out of all the closets in their home, because all the closets are all filled with guitars, as you can well imagine. Yeah, my wife loves that. Yeah, <laughs> and they were gracious enough to let us come into their home, and um, so I've got a little clip here for you folks. Of this is called Mark's guitar collection. How you doing? Welcome to my living room. Uh, behind you is uh, a sort of a representation of my guitar collection and I've got to tell you this is thrilling for me because I've never seen a collection of my instruments in one room before. This isn't all of it but it's a, it's a good representation of my life and, and, and my careers. Uh, so really the question is do I uh, do I buy guitars to collect or do I buy them to play or do I do a little bit of both? In, in my early years when I started making a little money in this business, which I never thought I would make, I, I, the one thing I always wanted to collect um, was guitars. And I always had a love for them. I always had a love specifically for acoustic guitars. Um, I own a bunch of electric guitars, but I own them specifically because I use them as tools. Where guitars, acoustic guitars, I just have a passion for them. This was, again, was the first nice guitar I ever bought uh, when, I, when I made enough money to go out and buy a good guitar. Um, and again, it's made by Santa Cruz. Um, but when I started um, with buying high-end uh, uh, acoustic guitars, I thought, you know what, I'm going to buy about seven or eight or nine of them a year and just get a big collection. And, and I did, but then I started noticing that, you know, I'm not playing all these things. And I felt sort of feeling oddly sad for the guitar. And um, so um, around, I don't know, maybe four years ago, five years ago, I started trading or selling them because I only wanted to have the guitars that I was using for my, in, in my career, um, the actual tools. Uh, because I just felt better for the instrument and I had a lot of instruments that were that were beautiful and rare and, and they needed to be played So I got rid of a bunch of those so now 
the guitars in my collection and and I have this is just a sampling of them I don't really know at this point how many guitars I own but um, uh, because I have banjos and ganjos and ukuleles and and high, uh, octave mandolins and all kinds of stringed instruments bass guitars electric guitars um, but these are really my special babies that I play all the time so uh, your, your the question is how, what, what two guitars do I record with most often um, so definitely um, this OM28, the Santa Cruz, uh, which is a small body, narrow instrument. It has, it's a very balanced acoustic guitar, so it just sounds great on pretty much any mic you put in front of it. This Gibson just has that big jangly sound, so as a rhythm instrument, studio guitars love playing it. Uh, it's an it's a easy, fast neck. It has uh, 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 quite a bounce sound for a Gibson, particularly, uh, but it has that uh, mid-range boost that most Gibsons have, and so these two sound distinctly different. Of course, this one being tiger stripe maple, maple back and sides, and this one being Brazilian rosewood back and sides. So this one sounds bright and big, and this one sounds rich and powerful. Which guitar, if I could pick one, uh, is my most prized possession? Frankly, I can't do that. I have, I have three guitars that I wouldn't want to live without, but you know what? I can live without any guitar uh, because I can go pick up another one. Uh, when it comes down to it, I love these things and I have a deep passion for each one of these guitars individually. Um, but between this, this Gibson J200 and this OM28 uh, and maybe a couple of other guitars, uh, like I would never get rid of the, the guitar that the Isaacs had made for me um, and, and because they have just intri intrinsic value um, I, I just can't pick one instrument um, and, and that said you know a guitar has to speak to me to make me want to play it it's, it's got to um, we have to have this instant language uh, between me and the guitar and if I don't have that it's not going to inspire me to be creative. Uh, and all of these instruments do. We have reached our time limit on the show. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. And uh, give a hand to Mark. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for, I thank you for coming out and, and wanting to see this. I cannot thank you enough for coming My back on the show pleasure. again, Mark. It has been wonderful. And um, I thought what we do is we just end with a little quick little pop quiz. Oh boy. Oh boy. Are you ready? I guess. Okay, here we go. Whole milk or skim? Whole. Whole. Pepsi or Coke? Coke. <laughs> Have you ever prayed for a hit song? Yes. <laughs> Did you get your prayer? Yes. <laughs> All-time favorite song. Doesn't matter who, whose it was. Um, please Come to Boston, Ooh, Dave Loggins. Great song. Favorite restaurant in Nashville? Um, oh, it is um, Smiling Elephant. Hmm? Not right. Which one? Smiling Elephant. Oh, okay. Um, if you could save any species, what species would it be? The sloth. <laughs> you asked. I thought for sure you'd say songwriters. No. <laughs> Again, I did. Sloths. <laughs> okay. Um, your best day ever. My best day ever, ever was um, April 1st of this year. A big awe from Jennifer. Um, number one on your bucket list. Uh, climbing Mount Everest. Really? Wow. Um, your favorite holiday destination, Mount Everest, no. <laughs> Napa Valley. Napa Valley. Last question. If you could produce anybody on the planet, alive 
or passed away, someone from the past, present, right? Anybody at all that you could produce, who would it be? Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yes. <sighs> How about a hand for Mark, guys? Thank you. Thank you so much. Be sure to subscribe for new episodes every month and join us next time.